Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to today's town hall. This is the second of four town halls that we will host this year. And it's our opportunity to share with you updates on the Winnipeg Health Region and the progress being made to provide the best health care to every person we serve. I'm Lindsay McKenzie, a member of the WRHA communications team and your moderator for the evening. Now I would like to invite the WRHA's board chair, Dr. Neetha Dick, to read the traditional territories acknowledgement on behalf of all of us at the Winnipeg Health Region who work and live on these lands. Thank you, Lindsay. And good evening, everyone. Welcome to the WRHA Public Town Hall. Thank you all for taking the time to attend this public town hall and for your participation this evening. I am Neetha Dick, and I'm very pleased to serve as the chair of the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority Board of Directors. On behalf of the WRHA Board, I would like to thank the leadership team for being accountable to the organization and the people by ensuring that we are reporting back to you on progress being made in delivering the best health care possible to every person we serve. I would like to begin our town hall by sharing the WRHA's statement of land acknowledgement that has recently been revised based on extensive consultation. The Winnipeg Health Region provides services to all nations on the traditional and ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, Ininawak, Anishinawak, Dakota Oyate, Dene, Inuit, and the national homeland of the Red River Metis. Treaties were created with the First Nations and include past, present, and future inhabitants, so we are all treaty people. Winnipeg Health Region serves those on Treaty 5 and Treaty 1 ter lands. We acknowledge that the five Dakota communities in Manitoba that are not signatories to any treaties with Canada. We acknowledge that Winnipeg takes its drinking water from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. We acknowledge that the acts of colonization, which are part of our history, have caused deep lasting harm, which continues today. We commit ourselves in a good way to learning about truth and reconciliation, promoting healing, and creating a better future for all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dick. We're pleased you are here today. If you're joining us and you have visual or hearing impairments, we want to let you know that Zoom supports a number of screen readers as well as closed caption and transcription options. As you find yourself in this Zoom webinar environment and are getting settled, you'll want to find the most optimal experience for you. At the top right corner of your screen, you will see a view icon. Click on it, and there you will find a few different options. For today, you'll want to click on presentation and speaker mode. You'll notice a two-way arrow when you hover over the line in between the presentation and the speaker or gallery. Click on it to make the presentation larger or smaller to suit your needs. As we kick off today's town hall, there are a few ways you'll be able to add your comments and ask your questions. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. If you have a question or comment you would like our presenters to address, please drop it there. You can upvote any of the questions by using the thumbs up emoji, which tells us which question or comments are most popular and are important for our presenters to answer. You can also add your questions by sending an email to townhalls at wrha.mb.ca if you feel more comfortable with that option. If you're experiencing technical difficulties at any point during today's presentation, drop your comments into the chat area. You can also use this area to add comments or reactions to what you're hearing. Now let's take a look at today's agenda. We'll start with a look at the newly developed WRHA dashboard, tracking key indicators and our performance as a health organization. Next, we'll look at progress being made towards tracking and then reducing mandated shifts with a particular look at Grace Hospital. And after that, we'll hear about a new project underway called Dignity and Care, and we'll hear from Indigenous Health and a project underway with Clan Mothers. Finally, we will hear how optimization and innovation are keys to the long-term sustainability of healthcare. At the end of the progress reports, there will be an extended Q&A discussion where you will get a chance to take yourself off mute and ask a question or offer feedback. And again, we'll put those questions into the chat rather than taking off mute. Um, and you can also ask your questions using a Q&A button or send an email using townhalls at wrha.mb.ca. 
And now I'll turn things over to Mike Nader, CEO and President of the WRHA, to start us off with his update. Thank you, Lindsay, and hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us tonight. You will have noticed that we have a new land acknowledgement, and this is only the second time that we've used it to open a public meeting. Over the past several months, we've been working with our board of directors, our Indigenous health team, and members of the community to update the land acknowledgement so that it better reflects our connection to the land we live, play, and work on. Equity and, and inclusivity are two of the new organizational values. In order to provide an environment where staff, patients, clients, and residents can feel safe and can access culturally safe care, we need to practice compassion and be accountable to each other and to those we serve. A land acknowledgement is part of working towards reconciliation. It's one of the ways that we can acknowledge our history and build understanding about how that history continues to impact our relationships to the land and to one another. Our new land acknowledgement includes acknowledging the sources of water and other resources that make it possible for us to provide care and ensure that we all have thriving communities here in Winnipeg. What is maybe more important than the new words is the new process that we'll be implementing. Like much of our work in healthcare, our efforts towards reconciliation are ongoing and continue to evolve and change. Rather than uh, just reading the text, the land acknowledgement will include reflections from the person delivering it about their history, their own relationship to the land, their own reconciliation work, and how we will continue to learn and take action. It will be different for each person who delivers it. Our goal is for the land acknowledgement to be reflective of each of us, true to our lived experience and to the moment that we're in. I'm also very happy to share an update on the hiring process for the new Chief Operating Officer Indigenous Health position, which will be a new leadership position sitting on the executive team. We have shortlisted several candidates and will be conducting interviews shortly in collaboration with Indigenous community leaders. I hope to make an announcement about the successful candidate very soon with each of you. Now, consistent with our values of accountability, I want to share with you the need new key performance indicator dashboard that is located on our website. The goal of the dashboard is to track the progress of the WRHA strategic plan based on key metrics related to priorities and goals. It also gives everyone a more holistic view of what is happening in the region. You'll see that we've included quantitative data that we're tracking, including workplace vacancy rates, sector expenditure ratios, our overall financial position, advisory council participation, as well as the emergency department wait times that we've historically tracked publicly. The dashboard will also include qualitative updates. Each quarter will highlight stories about our team members and the work that they do every day. These stories will demonstrate how the WRHA sites and programs are contributing to, towards achieving our goals. One of the metrics I wanted to touch on today is the patient experience survey scores. Right now, across the Winnipeg Health Region, any patient, client, or family member can fill out a patient experience survey. Members of the public will notice posters in all of our sites and facilities with a QR code and a link to fill out a, the survey electronically. If you don't have access to a smartphone, no problem. We have paper copies as well. You just need to ask a volunteer or a healthcare staff member for one of those copies. Since launching the short form survey in July of 2022, we have received more than 15,000 responses and we are averaging approximately 1,000 surveys a month across the entire health region, from our hospitals to our community centers to our long-term care facilities and personal care homes. In the second quarter, we had 2,670 responses and the average patient experience score across all service areas was 8.8 .8 out of 10. All in all, 72% of patients who completed the surveys rated their overall experience a nine or 10 out of 10. This is 3% above the target of 69% set by the province of Manitoba. We're also working on a process to help us respond to your feedback in real time. The process is triggered when someone submits a survey with a score of less than six or indicates on their survey that they feel that they did not receive dignity and care. Immediately, the person is asked if they want to opt in and receive a follow-up call 
from our patient relations and engagement team. It's still early days, but we can already see how this new tool is going to enable us to respond quick, more quickly to our patients and their feedback, and that we are listening to and acting on that feedback. I want to acknowledge our patient relations and engagement team for their efforts to help us live our values of collaboration, accountability, and inclusivity as we are empowering patients and the care teams to act quickly with this feedback. It's a critical part of delivering the best care to every person we serve, and this initiative will help us continually improve our ability to do that. So please keep those survey responses coming in to help us improve on the care that we are delivering to you. I'm looking forward to hearing your feedback on the real-time patient experience surveys and the WRHA performance dashboard. Please drop your comments or questions into the Zoom chat, and we'll be looking at them during the Q&A discussion a little later on. Thank you again for joining us this evening. It seemed like almost every shift somebody was being mandated. I remember coming in and we have our assignment on a whiteboard and there would be some days when that whiteboard was all white and there'd be a few names on it and you knew that you were gonna be mandated. We started off by saying, okay, well, we need to build trust with our staff. We need to start having conversations with them. We need to understand what some of the challenges and the barriers are. So we started these Let's Chat sessions. We started to have a recruitment and retention committee just to really start to hear their concerns. And they were angry, and rightfully so. They were exhausted. Um, they just wanted to be able to go home. They didn't want to have to work two shifts. They didn't want to have to bring two lunches. Um, and nobody can blame them. I don't think there's anyone who uh, wants that for anyone. It really required everyone's effort from frontline to management. We all were prioritizing our people. It was important to prioritize them. They know how to take care of patients. They don't need to be told how to do that. Um, but we had to make sure that they were, we were providing them with a great work environment and with the resources they needed to do their jobs. I think it was very important for us to be real because uh, this was real. I mean, people were coming in when they didn't want to, and it's a, it's a real, real situation. And so uh, facing this and tackling this problem with a human heart, um, I think from there, um, together we, we, were able to, we were able to achieve it. I work shift work and my husband works nine to five, Monday to Friday. I mean, at least now we feel free to, to make plans together where before we kind of maybe put it on hold a little bit wanting to come to work again, um, being proud to work at the Grace, and I am happy to encourage other people to come work with us. Jane McKay is the Chief Human Resources Officer with the WRHA. Jane, one of the mandates the former Ministry of Health had for all service delivery organizations last fall was to find a way to track, but also reduce mandatory shifts in healthcare. Your team has been working with the WRHA Business Performance and Planning Unit to find a way to address this. As we saw in the video, Grace Hospital is working with directors, managers, and supervisors to make significant progress on the reduction of mandated shift hours. What does the story of Grace Hospital tell us about what we can do to make similar progress across the Winnipeg Health region? Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. So as you saw in the video, the progress Grace Hospital has made to reduce mandate, mandated shifts has been really outstanding. The entire Grace Hospital team should be immensely proud of the work that's been done and the results that they've achieved. And I know that the Winnipeg Health Region sure is, and we're very, cool, very grateful for their efforts. Shifting the culture at Grace aligns with the R team pillar of our WRHA strategic plan. And this means that we work together to put accountability and collaboration into action by listening to staff so that we can understand their needs and perspectives, action their priorities, and empower solutions with both heart and hard work. 
As a result, by doing just that, Grace has not only reduced mandatory overtime, they've been able to make progress in attracting and retaining staff to the front lines of care. When we look at Grace Hospital data on workforce vacancy rates for the second quarter, which is between July and the end of September, we see that their vacancies have declined from 28% to 21.6%. And most significantly, their emergency department has had a 44% reduction in vacancy rates for nurses. There's still much more to be done at Grace. However, their recipes for success and their key learnings are being shared with all our other hospital sites across the Winnipeg Health Region. And before I wrap up, I just want to share that last month I got the chance to welcome our very first healthcare recruit from the Philippines, who is working as a healthcare aide within our region. And tomorrow, we look forward to welcoming a nurse who will be working at Grace Hospital. So that's really exciting news. As always, your feedback is really important. So please feel free to drop your comments and questions into the chat room uh, or uh, feel free to uh, reach out uh, directly uh, through email. Thanks very much. Together with patient partners, with healthcare staff and leaders, we want to create a culture where dignity, trust and compassion are cultivated. Both personally and professionally, this has been something where I've encountered the positive and the not so positive and wanted to be able to be a part of sharing my experiences and hoping that I can help make the system a little better. Right now, um, we're in the listening stage. So we're hearing from people with lived and living experience of the healthcare system, that's patients, clients, residents, their families. I want to fight for dignified care for people who have illnesses such as mine, or just for other people that are having difficulty in care because they come from marginalized parts of society that may not be taken as seriously. I think that until these experiences come to light and the problem is actually understood, we can't start reaching out to fix it. I don't see there being really an end to this project. Um, there's always opportunities to improve and there really are no limitations to what we can do to improve um, compassion and dignity in our healthcare system. Ultimately though, what we're looking for are tools and resources designed by the people working on the ground, the people we're serving, um, to make it so that we can have compassionate and dignified interactions at every um, stage of the care process. Christian Jordan is the regional lead for quality, patient safety, and accreditation with the WRHA, and her team is leading a project called Dignity and Care, which you saw a bit about in the video that just played. Kirsten, you've shared that Dignity and Care is a passion project for you and your team. Can you share with me what's got you so excited about what you're learning so far? Thanks, Lindsay, absolutely. Ultimately, I believe that healthcare is for everyone, a universal human right. While the doors to our healthcare facilities are open to anyone seeking care, we know that not everyone feels safe to ask for the help that they need. I'm sure many of us are familiar with the saying, treat people as you would like to be treated. For me, dignity and care means taking this one step further and asking patients how they would like to be treated. We want to go beyond a welcome poster in a waiting room or the buttons we wear on our name tags to share our pronouns. These are important, but what's more important is engaging in conversations and actions that support in practice what they signify. This project is about ensuring all patients, clients and residents, along with their loved ones, feel safe, valued and respected when seeking care. Before I share more details, I want to acknowledge our healthcare providers who come to work to serve patients with kindness and expertise every day. This project will build on their strong foundation and reflects our organizational commitment to continually learn from our patients and families to improve the care that we provide. As we began to consider this work, it quickly became obvious that dignity and care means many different things to people. So our starting point has been consulting and collaborating with a broad range of people, both within and outside of our organization. So far, we have completed consultations with 30 individuals, including patients and family members, 
people identifying as 2S LGBTQ2+, people identifying as members of Indigenous communities, healthcare leaders across the system, and subject matter experts, which would include researchers and community leaders. We are now planning to collaborate with our community-based organizations to meet our most vulnerable populations where they seek care. We will be relying on the community teams who have developed trusting relationships to help us engage with respect and compassion. We are establishing an advisory committee that includes a researcher and subject matter expert in dignity and care, care providers from all parts of the system, including Indigenous health, a Francophone community member, and patient and family partners with perspectives around 2S LGBTQ2+, and the newcomer experience. This is part of my team's commitment under the strategic plan to ensure we have ongoing input and are collaborating continually with patients, clients, and residents to make sure that they are truly partners in this work. Finally, I would like to acknowledge that this is incredibly important. It takes time to get it right. Our first goal is to use what we've heard in our consultations to develop a definition of dignity and care for the Winnipeg Health Region. This along with next steps and a communication plan will be completed by the end of March, 2024. This is truly just the beginning of our ongoing efforts to make sure everyone we serve feels safe in accessing care. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about this project. I'd love to hear from you. Please leave your feedback or suggestions or any questions you might have in the chat. Thanks very much. This is where all the soil linen arrives from, all the hospital and long-term care facility. Uh, on average, we get about 250 carts per day um, that we process um, and send back to the hospitals and long-term care facilities. So this is our baler. So basically all the plastic bag gets compacted into a massive bale. And then after that, um, the company comes to get it. So it's being recycled, reutilized, and formed into pellets into different type of bags. The moment that it's sorted, the next time it's being touched is when it's on the clean side. So we don't have staff um, doing repetitive motion that could increase musculoskeletal injuries. Um, it's absolutely amazing on um, preventing WCB uh, claims. Um, and at the same time, it's a very efficient process. The one at the end is the newest one. So uh, the beauty behind it is um, it is insulated a little bit better. That means the amount of heat we lose is less. So it means that um, less steam is required, less natural gas is being used. So um, there is some cost saving there. Once it gets to the end, the water that's being utilized here, which is clean water, goes back to be used at the beginning of the cycle. So we're not wasting a large amount of water like a, like a residential washing machine. Once they use it, it drains out. So each tunnel has seven dryers connected to it. So every four minutes we produce 100 kilograms of clean linen that will be put into one of the dryers that approximately takes half an hour to dry. These machines are running about 12 to 14 hours a day. So they are going continuously and then I have uh, my maintenance crew do all the preventive maintenance in between shifts and at the end of the shift. We have a mechanical hand that's gonna pick the linen. What it does is it removes, um, as the linen is washed, it could get tangled. So it removes that uh, potential injury of staff trying to grab the linen, pull it into the back, their hand.
with UV light within, you can put six carts in within a minute, is completely sanitized. It removes every type of viruses, bacteria, you name it, destroys um, those uh, microorganisms. Uh, Dan Skorchuk is the Regional Lead for Corporate Services and Chief Financial Officer. And in addition to balance sheets and forecasting expenses, his team works with many different sites, programs, and areas to find innovative and creative ways to ensure that our healthcare system is performing well and will be healthy for years to come. Dan, when we think about the word sustainability, it often gets mistaken for finding efficiencies or it is thought of as a way to spotlight climate or environmental impacts to operations. But sustainability is also about optimization. Can you tell me a bit more about what this means in practice? Most certainly. Uh, many of us associate sustainability with taking something away. But when it comes to the work that we're doing, our focus is on being innovative and finding new and creative ways of doing things. Ultimately, what this means is that we're looking at processes that will help us optimize our performance as a health system. It's about working smarter, not harder. This will be the first year where without supplementary funding from governments to close financial gaps caused by the pandemic. We're projecting a deficit this year because of the unpredictability that goes along with observing post-pandemic changes. We're adjusting and responding to the ways an endemic impacts things like supplies and equipment for care delivery. These things are necessary to keep staff, patients, clients, and residents, and the community safe. Things like personal protective equipment and mask fit testing, which during the pandemic we were reimbursed for by the provincial government. It's also the result of the impacts of our human power deficit. The staffing issues we're facing across the system come with a cost through things like overtime, super premiums, and medical remuneration. The need to be innovative is driven by our current financial outlook. As a health region, we're coping with the after effects of COVID-19 on both staffing and equipment. Neither of these are where there is much room for change given our current circumstances. That's why it's so important that we focus on innovation and optimization for sustainability that we can control. Change doesn't have to be big to have an impact from a sustainability perspective. For example, the facilities team at 650 Main Street, our corporate office, simply suggested not plowing the top floor of the building parquet this past winter. This had little to no impact on the staff in the building, particularly in what is now a hybrid work from home model, and we were able to save $120,000. Now $120,000 may not seem like much in terms of our overall budget, but it's not an insignificant amount of money. And these small changes all add up. Through about two dozen sustainability initiatives, we were able to save a total of $13 million annually. So when we work together and collaborate to find new or better ways of doing things, we can make significant impacts on sustainability. Thanks very much for giving me an opportunity to share more about what we can look for in optimization opportunities. And I'd love to hear from you, your feedback and questions uh, you might have on this topic. Please feel free to drop them in the chat. Thank you very much. A day like today, which is focused on kind of education um, and opening doors is really important. We've brought a group of uh, some staff um, members throughout the the, throughout the region, our summer students um, come together with an elder and members of clan, clan mothers um, to do some medicine picking and to learn more about the or around the teachings of the medicines. It's a relatively new uh, partnership that's that that's that we've uh, uh, entered into with the clan mothers. So um, more around it's not so much patient direct patient care. It's more around the education that that we provide. Um, to staff, to you know, healthcare professionals. We want to have people educated when you know in the you know in providing culturally safe care to patients. Today, um, what we're focused on picking is sage. Um, there are four sacred medicines that are commonly used, but sage is the one that is is most most commonly used in smudge. What you will find most often is that folks um, 
are going to be using it to smudge. Um, and they will be using it in times of high stress or negative energy. Um, and it's kind of a way to restore you back to that, that place of balance. It's important that we understand that these teachings um, are accessible to everybody. And it's not, it's not just meant to be for Indigenous people only. Um, and that we open the door with love and we open the door with respect. Um, and we, we build those, those connections for people. Bonita Keller is the Interim Regional Director of Indigenous Health for the WRHA. Bonita, what we saw in this video was Clan Mothers, an Indigenous-led organization partnering with Indigenous Health and the WRHA to share the traditional teaching of medicine picking with some of our staff. How did this initiative come about? Hi there, thanks Lindsay. Um, so we've heard a lot from staff caring for Indigenous patients that they want to learn more about the traditional teachings because patients and families are asking for these practices when they visit our hospitals. Patients talk about their teachings, such as participating in a sweat or asking to smudge because it gives them comfort. And part of culturally safe care is bringing these teachings into care delivery and staff knowing where to access these practices for their patients. So one component to what our team in Indigenous Health provides is educational teaching and training for WHA staff. Faye Tardif and Lorraine Sevright, IH Education and Training Coordinators, regularly bring elders and traditional knowledge keepers into the dialogue when building courses or offering traditional knowledge keeping. So elders provide this guidance and that's why the partnership with Clan Mothers is in place. Indigenous Health worked with Clan Mothers to co-develop this approach. So what you saw in the video was the start of a formal partnership that began earlier this spring. One of the other things that's important about the partnership with Clan Mothers is community con connection. And we're also in the process of creating an advisory circle to guide future educational opportunities as well. As the Winnipeg Health Region, we have to understand and have knowledge about traditional practices of Indigenous people if we are ensuring we're providing care that is in line with our shared values to be equitable and inclusive. I'm looking forward to hearing um, of any feedback on the code led approach that we are developing with Clan Mothers. So please feel free to drop any comments and questions into the Zoom chat, and we can look at them during the question, the Q&A discussion a little bit later on. So Benita, one of the other important initiatives Indigenous Health has been involved with is the rewriting of the traditional land acknowledgement put into practice by the WRHA earlier in this town hall. Now, to be clear, this practice is the ongoing rededication to the journey of reconciliation. And that is why our board chair, Dr. Neetha Dick, began the town hall for us by reading this newly developed land acknowledgement. So how is Indigenous Health involved in developing it? Okay, thanks again, Lindsay. Uh, so Indigenous Health had a supporting role in the work of redeveloping the traditional land acknowledgement that the WHA uses with leadership on the board. So when we read the land acknowledgement statement, using the same words and reading it in the same manner over and over again, it tends to lose its impact. So we want individuals in the larger community to hear the words being spoken and make sure that those, those reading them are holding true to the commitment they are making. So you heard in the revised writing uh, of the traditional land acknowledgement, drawing attention to our water supply that comes from Shoal Lake 41st Nation, and the mention of five uh, Dakota nations who are not signatories of treaties and reside in, uh, reside in the boundaries of Manitoba. But this won't be the last time that we were, that we, we work the land acknowledgement. In a few years time, we're going to need to redevelop it again as the practice of reconciliation continues to shift and change. Thank you, Benita. And thank you to the members of the executive leadership team who shared progress updates on these strategic priorities. We've now come to the time in the evening where we will get to your questions and have a discussion and some answers. Um, so I'd like to invite all the members of the executive team here to take themselves uh, on mute and on camera uh, so that we can engage in, in these questions and, and their answers. A uh, reminder to put your questions in the Q&A feature in Zoom, or you can also email your questions to townhalls at wrha.mb.ca. You can also upvote those questions using a thumbs up emoji.
And just a reminder, this is uh, a place that we want to be a safe space um, where people feel comfortable to express their perspectives and be heard, as well as uh, keeping things kind and respectful will go a long way to doing that. So we did have a number of questions um, come in while we were sharing our updates. So just to recap, um, we had a question about the next job fair. So the WRHA hosted a job fair for uncertified home care attendants uh, earlier this month. And so we encourage you to check out the careers website for more information. Um, follow the WRHA's Facebook page where you will see updated information as well. And we do hope that we're hosting another job fair in January, 2024. Another question came in in regards to mandated shifts and where they are occurring. Um, and if there's a greater degree of, of information available across different sites. And so I would, would direct you to our performance dashboard, which is available at wrha.mb.ca slash the plan. And so right now you can see workforce vacancy rates um, across the system. Um, and we are working to allow for that dashboard to be sorted by by particular site and area. So that was another question. And to pull from a question that came in via email, um, I'll just ask it here and, and Mike, I'll direct it to you. Um, so the question is, why doesn't the Winnipeg region have a contract with QDOC? It has helped me before when no other service was available, but now there is a delay for Winnipeg residents because of the WRHA. I can't get a family doctor, and this is true for many Manitobans. Today's Free Press article says, Manitobans have the second lowest number of doctors per capita looking after them. And it's a national report that, that was released Monday. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. And, and certainly I think we all acknowledge that the availability of uh, family doctors is a challenge for all communities across Canada. Um, QDOCS, for those who are not familiar with it, is a service that offers uh, virtual care. You can log on to the website uh, and gain access to a family physician who can uh, help you with whatever primary care need that you require. Uh, we do have a meeting lined up with the QDOC executive. I believe it's for some time in November, so in the, in the coming month. Uh, but in the meantime, anyone can access uh, services through QDOC by logging onto their website and um, going through the process of filling out your your care your care um, your personal health information. Um, and uh, you can get uh, access to a family physician through that service. So um, it doesn't really have anything to do with a contract with the WRHA. It's a public service that's available and uh, is funded through the Manitoba Health System. Thanks for that, Mike. The other question that we received in our chat, um, and Jane Jane answered a bit of it here, um, but I'll, I'll ask it again. Um, what's the plan for the WRHA to address workplace integrity issues? For example, bullying, harassment, intimidation by both managers and or colleagues. Um, what sort of policies or procedures do we have in place if staff are observing that, or even if members of the public are observing something like that? Yeah. Uh, great question. Um, obviously, we don't have we don't tolerate that um, in our workplace. Um, so we have a respectful workplace policy and a procedure um, that uh, we've had for uh, a few years now, um, and uh, it uh, works well. And I would encourage anyone that finds themselves in that situation. Um, to raise the concern with their manager, if it's appropriate, um, or directly with human resources, and we will uh, certainly um, take appropriate action. Thanks for that, James. Uh, the next question, um, and I might direct it towards Dan. Dan, you might know, um, and if not, we can always get back to this, uh, to, to Mary Jean. So the question is, how often does the air within the hospital get exchanged every hour? Has ventilation system been upgraded since COVID? Yeah, I can answer generally. I don't have any specifics, but uh, I do know that different clinical environments warrant different levels of exchange rates uh, from an air handling perspective. Uh, and I can cert I'd be happy to get more details on that. Um, and I do know that there have been a number of safety and security enhancements that have been funded uh, to the WRHA by the province of Manitoba. Um, 
around the time of COVID and post COVID. Uh, so select sites have been uh, chosen, uh, have been identified for upgrades and those are projects that are actively underway. Again, I'd be happy to get the details following the, uh, following the webinar. Thanks, Dan, I appreciate the answer. And again, we can look to find a uh, more detailed response and post that for you, Mary Jean. Uh, so the next question here comes from Paula. It says, a few weeks ago, I was part of the R Care Priorities Panel for Primary Care. Does the WHA have any comment on it? Yeah, maybe, Lindsay, I'll jump in on this. Um, I'm really excited about the R Care uh, Priorities Panel for Primary Care that was launched. Uh, it's an initiative that's been launched uh, across the country where um, a group of researchers have been reaching out and hearing from the public around what they would like to see as it relates to primary care across the uh, country. Unfortunately, I missed the, um, the, the report out session that was uh, scheduled. I was on an accreditation in another province, uh, but I am looking forward to getting the report and looking at the feedback. So once we see that, we'll be looking at it and in trying to incorporate it into the work that we're doing moving forward. Thanks for that. So we have another question here. I'm a primary care provider, or I'm a primary caregiver for my parent who depends on home care and pays for Lifeline. I understand they are eligible to have it offered at no cost to clients deemed high risk in particular areas. How is it today that the first time, this is the first time I've read about it, connection to clients directly or their primary caregivers is lacking beyond the workers themselves? If improvements are being made to the home care system, what consultations and engagements might be offered and how will we be notified? And I think I'll, um, you know, we, we normally we have Tara Lee Proctor on the call. She's our VP of, of Community Health and Continuing Care. Um, so I think that is part of our answers. We need to get back to you with that. Um, also, I think, Mike, would you like to field this question for us? Well, it's a, it's a big question. Certainly, we do recognize that there's a lot of work that we need to do in our home and community care sector, um, a lot of work around modernization, a lot of work around ensuring that the community understands what services are available to them. Uh, in my experience, uh, that's one of the biggest challenges that we have is ensuring that the general public understands uh, what home care resources are available, what respite resources are available at a day care programming community programming is available. So this is an area that um, I think every jurisdiction across the country uh, needs to work on and certainly something that we need to work on. Um, in the home care realm, I know there is a lot of work, uh, certainly in the media recently, there was uh, a report around a palliative care client where um, as the WRHA, we didn't, we didn't do a good job in terms of uh, of the, the issues. And um, we had an independent consultants report that made a series of recommendations, um, which uh, we have talked about in the public and are in the process of implementing. So um, I think Tara Lee would certainly be able to uh, give more specifics about some of the improvements that are underway in the home care sector. Uh, but I will say, I, I do think that that's an area just communicating what those improvements are and what services are available is an area that we need to do better on. Thanks for that, Mike. Um, one of the things I'll add is that we're, we've recently published um, a public engagement talk on system navigators for older adults. And so that's going to be taking place in person and via live stream on November 20th. There's information about that on Facebook, the WRHA's Facebook page, um, as well as online. And so it's a great place to ask your questions about those system navigator organizations that can help answer some of these questions like this, where you're trying to ensure that the proper program systems, supports, resources are in place for those that you care for. And we don't have any more questions. So unless I get another one here in the next moment, I think we are going to wrap the Q&A portion up. So I just want to thank everyone for your time today. Thank you for all the questions. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is, is a pulse survey for the public. So we ask that you fill out that survey um, and let us know how we're doing in terms of communication and engagement with you 
on those things like available services and access to them. It's your opportunity to tell us how you're feeling about the strategic plan, which was newly developed as well, and our progress being made on these priorities and how you see yourself in the bigger picture of this long-term planning. It's a very short survey, it's only seven questions, should take you about five minutes to complete. Thank you again for your participation. We really appreciate your, your attendance tonight. As we move forward, um, your suggestions and, and your advice on, on how we improve communication and engagement is, is very important to us. And, and so now I'll turn it over to Mike for some closing remarks. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. And listen, I wanna thank everyone for joining us uh, for today's uh, town hall in the, the evening. I especially wanna thank our executive leadership team for taking time away from their family and their loved ones uh, to provide updates to the public. Just as a reminder to check back and please have a look at the WRHA performance reporting dashboard that will be found on the wrha.mb.ca forward slash the plan. It might even be helpful for you to bookmark it in your internet browser. Uh, we update the key performance indicators um, uh, regularly and add new updates on projects and initiatives that are helping us move the needle in these measures. So again, thank you all for taking time out of your evening and uh, I wish you a good evening, thanks. Thank you, Mike. And again, um, thank you for everyone for coming today. Uh, we will have another town hall in January, on January 30th. So please mark your calendars for that. Thanks everyone and have a good night.